Hey guys, so your chimney's either got leaks in it or the top rocks are falling off. You've already checked on YouTube and a bunch of videos are for bricks, which are so much easier to form and pour a cap onto. This video is going to show you the tricks that certainly work on a brick chimney, but they also work on a stone chimney. Getting that form to work, getting a proper drip edge, getting it strong, everything's coming up in this video here. Please check out our channel, please like and subscribe and uh, share it with your friends and check out all the details. We've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, this is not our first, second, or third rodeo. It's pretty much how I've uh, kept my family alive is capping and chimneys and repairing them. So we've got quite a few tricks coming up here. Uh, please watch and enjoy. Hey guys, this chimney failed. Beautiful fireplace, only about 20 years old. The reason it failed is it doesn't have a good quality concrete cap. We're gonna show you the steps and it's not that hard to get your lumber around this thing, chink in these holes, and pour a nice cap that goes out, gives it a good overhang, lets the water drip free of it with a drip channel in it. And uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years. We've got a bunch of tricks on this. Keep an eye out, we're gonna go through the process. All right, so this is the trickiest part. You're trying to build carpentry on a big masonry mess. Uh, and the trick we found out for that, we just take these about 12 inches long, two by something, screw them to each other, put one on each corner, get a ratchet strap, and crank them together. And we've got them roughly level, but then we're gonna take any old two by, and we're gonna get that dead level. This top will be screwed into these, which it's amazing how much friction. When, you, when you've got that piece of wood and then you crank it in, that wood's squishing right around the stone. It's holding tight. And now we just screw these guys on and that becomes the beginning of what will be our finished form structure that will hold the concrete on top. That's probably the biggest trick, but keep watching. All right, so we screwed those uh, connecting pieces on. Then we did our first flats. That's the, uh, this is going to be the underside of that form. Then there's going to be a 2 by 6 on, on this side, which will hold the mortar uh, concrete back. Now we've got this embarrassing little crack situation going on. And the best way to handle that is fiberglass. It has an amazing capacity to kind of let the, the water uh, kind of binds up in it and mortar doesn't really, or the concrete doesn't really break through. So we stuff all that crazy stuff fairly tightly, pack it if necessary, with fiberglass. And then you'll see in the next step, we're actually, after we've uh, put our quarter round on, we're actually gonna put a mortar uh, bed over top of that. Then we leave it overnight till at least the next day to pour the main pour of concrete on top. But that is our trick, fiberglass in the wild joints. So this is the drip channel. In, in the real world, water can flow uphill, strangely enough. If water's on this cap, it comes off, instead of dripping loose, it can capillary back and then start running either up under the, the uh, stones or just running in sheets down the masonry. And any of that water application is just gonna deteriorate over time. It doesn't seem like it should do a whole lot of damage one rain, but every rain for years and years, especially if it's an acidic rain, can do a lot of damage. So what we do, is take three quarter inch quarter round, 45 it at the corners, and we place this first. Right after we've packed the, the pink, we place this stuff. We've been finding pretty good luck with these GRK kind of a thin shank wide head uh, cabinet screw. I did mention the cabinet screw thing rather than a finish nail, because you can have a disaster of a time if you use a finish nail on this. And then after you're all done, you pop the form out, the form drops and the finish nail head pops through and these pieces are stuck on the underside of your concrete and you'll be forever trying to pull them out because when they get wet, the wood actually expands. Uh, so use a screw, a thin screw with a fat head to hold that on and then we're uh, gonna do our sidewalls. So that next trick is, uh, is running these verticals around. You notice they're a little bit long each time that's mostly just because I don't want to be doing some perfect cabinet work 
usually the chimney itself isn't a perfect square. You try to eyeball as square as you can, but if you try to be perfect up here, you're gonna have trouble. But you just have to measure, get your rough measurement what how the length is and add three or four inches. And then you can button past, just go long, butt into it, pass, go long, butt into it, go past. Then you can still get a nice square, clean edge on the inside and it's just a whole lot easier. I want to mention when you're screwing these things in, remember you got to take this thing apart. <laughs> you got to take this thing apart and there's going to be concrete in here. So the last thing you want to do is put a screw in here that you can never pull out and that screw has bound one side to the other. I'm saying this because I've done that before and it's a giant debacle and it doesn't saw us all well or whatever. So we want to keep all our screws on that, like underneath where these two bys are, we've got screws. Underneath here, up in, we've got screws. Those are places we can get to. We of course did have to screw these uh, corner beads and one trick, if you want to ever take those screws out, get a little bit of a Vaseline or a white grease and put a dab of grease or peanut butter. I've done that when I didn't have anything else. Leaving a little bit of peanut butter on that top will make it so when you put the concrete in, the concrete doesn't go into your screw head and make it so you can never take the screw out. Same thing, if you had a keystone screw out here that was on a flat surface, the chances of you slopping a little bit of concrete into that screw head out here are high. Hit that with a little bit of grease or peanut butter or something and you'd be better off. So the next step, again, we got to take this thing apart, is uh, making it so the mortar doesn't stick to your wood. And the best way I've found, the form grease, good old WD-40, one more use for it, is hitting, I mean this thing is key, you don't want this guy to get stuck in there, so we hit that with the WD-40 and all the way around the edges. Now, if you were to pour this thing right now with just this foam, or with just this uh, pink uh, insulation, more than likely at some point, the concrete would break through drip you'd have a giant drippy concretey mess a sinkhole that you'd be trying to fit disaster so what we do we do it in a two-day process this is day one we make regular mortar maybe a little bit sweetened and we pack it over the foam and let it cure overnight keeping it away from the quarter round uh, once that's cured overnight, now tomorrow I can pour away without any issue. There's another concern, I mean, we've got a, we've got a kind of a tarp skirt on this thing. There still could be chances of that kind of Portland water mix dripping and that leaves a nasty white stain, especially on a metal roof that you want to avoid. So if you want to really do it in overkill mode, just take any old cheap caulk and caulk these corners, swipe them off so that it's pretty much a watertight form. And there's no way to get that without, if you gotta do this mortar system here. And then you're pretty much in good shape for uh, even a sloppy pour of concrete shouldn't go through the joints. It's gonna be another trick there when we uh, pour this thing tomorrow. We'll go over the reinforcement and the pouring. But today, we're gonna just point the rest of this guy and uh, walk away for the day. So we've dangled on the roof, we've made this form, so important that we make quality, quality concrete. And I'm gonna run you through a couple of tricks. A lot of times we use our own aggregate and our own Portland and make it from scratch, but practically it makes sense to make it with quick creep bag. This is only, you know, average cap is six to 10 bags. Uh, it's not worth getting too crazy with, but you want it to be good stuff. Uh, we use an electric mixer. You can certainly mix it in your wheelbarrow. Make sure you mix it slow. Don't store, heat and cold screw up concrete. Uh, I've had a situation where we stored the concrete out in the blaring sun and the bags were like 110 degrees. When you do that, you accelerate the cure and accelerate the time it takes for that water to get out of it and it just never reaches its peak uh, strength. So you wanna keep everything on the cooler side. Obviously if it's winter, there's a whole different set of things you wanna keep on the warmer side and below 32 degrees is a whole up another discussion. But keep things on the cooler side. So we would do uh, probably two two bags of quick creep to a to a batch in the 
in the uh, mixer. I'm not going to run the mixer because you don't want to hear that grinding any more than I do. Now, here's the secret. I'm sure that the fine people at Crick Creek figured out optimal amount of Portland to gravel and sand to make sure that they made a profit. Since we're not really worried about uh, metric tons here of profit, we can afford an extra $12 for actual Portland concrete. That's what this Portland cement. Portland cement is the ingredient, the binder that binds the sand and gravel. I and mean, here's some gravel and sand, almost like what is in there. But it's the Portland cement that, when it is perfectly uh, encased around each granule, binds the granules together and makes a good concrete. I'm sure Quickcrete has that right near the minimum because this costs more than gravel. So we are going to enrich in it with, for, for every bag of, of Quickcrete, maybe a half a scoop or so of Portland. You can take that too far. Don't go crazy and, uh, and over Portland it because you, you think you can make it the best ever. Uh, but add about, you know, basically a scoop or so to a bag uh, and mix that up very well. That's part of the key, if you're, especially if you're mixing the wheelbarrow. Just because it's wet doesn't mean it's done. You want to tumble all that material so that you've got all the Portland encased and you don't want to go too wet. If you get it too wet, it's just never going to reach the same uh, strength as it can if it's on the drier side. However, if you keep it too dry, it never compacts right, you get other issues. So there's a fine line there, and some of that you can only get with the feel. But you just look at the consistency we go through. You'll see we, uh, we're going to run a, a wetter batch for the first one, which goes around the bottom. Then we're going to increase the slump uh, to a drier batch as we go up toward the top. But that's our tricks. Use nice, clean, cold water to mix with. Use less water as you go and get it up to the right uh, amount as you go along and then throw it in a bucket and somehow safely haul it up on your chimney. That's where you'll see it next. All right, so we've waited a day. The mortar that we covered all those crazy gaps with is now closed. We use Durawall. That's a material that's used uh, on cement blocks because that's a reinforcement. Concrete on its own isn't that strong. It's the metrics between concrete and steel that binds things together. Even if there's a crack, if there's steel, the crack can't pull apart. The disadvantage of using like heavy, normal half inch rebar here is this is a thin pour, and you really, for rebar to be optimal, you should have four inches of concrete above it and below it. Uh, so you need to use a lighter material. The other beauty of this stuff is it's galvanized, so it's not going to rust as readily. Uh, and it has a little bit of flexibility. The last thing you want is for one of these caps to crack again. That's why you ended up here in the first place, usually. Uh, another thing. Uh, federal code requires that you have an expansion joint around all your uh, clay flue tile caps. I also didn't mention, this was kind of an optimum situation. Often when you're doing this, you'll find out in order to get the pitch you want out of your cap, you have to add a uh, flu extension there. I can show you that in another video. But pretty simple. You may have to cut the thing and uh, set it on and make the joint somewhere buried in your uh, concrete cap. But this situation is pretty good. This is nice and proud. You never want to have your concrete cap even steven with the top of the flu. Reason being, water could or splash could go in there, but in the winter you can get a snow piling here turns into ice, makes a little bit of a dam, and now water and everything can pour down. So you want a minimum of four inches uh, above your concrete to the top of your cap. It's also good to have your two caps at different levels. It reduces the likelihood that they're going to backdraft into each other. But, so the federal code requires that you have an expansion joint based on the fact that the, the flue is going to expand and contract because it's got heat in it and it's going to expand and contract at a different rate of the concrete and if it wants to expand and hits against the concrete, you crack. Uh, and that's true and I do that on a real, on a fireplace that I build from scratch, from start to finish, I put that expansion joint in there. But on these repair jobs, it's usually due to the fact that not a whole lot of people are up on a roof. And if you put, this is how, if I was to do it for real, I would take this sill seal and give it one or two wraps around and duct tape it. Then I'd pour my concrete to it. After that was cured, I'd take a utility knife, cut that off, 
and then I'd caulk that joint. And that would allow for any expansion contraction to happen. However, here, we're not gonna do that. Uh, this thing's 20 years old. It's been mortared in solid. It hasn't expanded and contracted to a cracking point. If I was to put that foam on now, and that would require that someone every couple years works and checks on that caulk joint. Otherwise, we have water getting in here and causing all sorts of havoc. So we're gonna avoid that here, and I usually do avoid that on a uh, chimney repair, especially if I see it's already proven not to be a factor. You got to think in reality that you know the fire may be 1600 degrees downstairs, but we're 25 feet away and that heat has dissipated dramatically. This may be only 100 150 degrees inside this, so the expansion isn't that big of a deal, and trying to solve that problem could cause a bigger one. Okay, enough on that. Uh, we've already talked about how we mix our concrete, and we're pretty picky about that, as you can see. Our first batch of concrete is a little bit on the wetter side. The reason is, we've got a lot of nooks and crannies to get around. We want to get around that drip edge that we put in there, and we want to avoid what they call honeycomb. This happens a lot, especially early on when I was pouring these things. I'd pour it, stuff it in as best I could, poke it against. Three days later, I'd come pull the forms out and I got these nasty pock marks all over. At the very least, it doesn't look good. At the worst, it actually, it's a weak point where the water gets to come in. We've got some tricks for that now though. So obviously, on the second batch, or on the top batch, we want it on the stiffer side because we've got to build up a slump to make this uh, 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 pitch. But here, we're going to use a wetter concrete. I still, I hand work it in. I do pack it, pack it a few times. And then the, the classic trick is to hit it with a hammer. But you're about to see something more amazing than that. And I have done that meticulously. Hit it with the hammer, worked it in with the trowel, still pulled it off and still cried all day long because I still got those pock marks. Until I invented a miniature vibrator. You set most any drill on hammer drill, put any old dud flattish bit on it, set it on the side, Put some pressure on. See what's happening there? Bubbles are popping up. We're gonna do this all along as we go along. This is the trick of the video, really. Set a screw gun on a hammer drill and uh, apply pressure. And you will now vibrate. When you pull this thing off, it's gonna look like a perfectly cast in the factory cap. Uh, so that's our steps there. We're gonna go through the next one as we build up that slump. All right, so we've got a drier, a much drier layer of concrete on the top because we want this thing to have a pitch. We want water to be screaming off this. That's the whole point. Oh, and I want to show you my fancy trick again. This is your last chance to run your fancy vibrator. Put that in the low gear too, on the hammer. Oh, taking all the bubbles out. I've already done that pretty much all the way around. I did whack it with the hammer too, but now if you whack it with the hammer or worry about that uh, vibrator, you're gonna lose your slump. Now, this is a, all of, all of masonry is kind of like Goldilocks. You can go too hot or too cold or too dry or too wet or whatever. Uh, my brother just mixes concrete. He usually pretty much nails it as the right level of uh, moisture for each application. If this was too dry, if you start spanking it, and the water doesn't come up, then it's too dry. If it stays, I'm just gonna lightly whack that. If it stays with all those light open spots there, then those are gonna be permeated throughout everything and your strength's gonna be much less. If it's so wet uh, and juicy that the thing's already slumping and mushrooming and everything already, then you're, you're gonna have weak concrete and you're never gonna get this slump the way you want it. But again, just like any other part of it, you can do too much tooling with it too. I'm gonna work this guy up. I'm gonna try to whack some of the bigger rocks. That's what this whole this float tool does basically, is just kind of drive the drive the rocks down to give you something of a smooth surface to work with. Uh, but I don't wanna do this a lot. I wanna do this just enough. Because if you do this a lot, you're gonna drive the rocks down, eventually you're gonna drive the sand down, and you're gonna leave just a little bit of a Portland-y uh, skim on the surface, which will look good in the first three, four days, but it doesn't have that matrix that gives it the strength, and the rain 
will wash that thing right off and you'll lose your surface. So you want to be just about optimal, not too much, not too little. I whacked the rocks down real quick. Now this isn't a real big one. Some of these things are six feet long or whatever. So I want to just show you what we would do to kind of, we screed, we screed on an angle, basically. You can use your four foot level. Don't tell anybody I said this. You can use your four foot uh, aluminum level and just rinse it off afterwards and keep it a secret between us. Uh, so you can kind of screed up. Also while you're screeding, you're driving the rocks down to a point. Get it pretty close. Work it so that there's no obvious pot marks going on. And then the other trick is, once you've done, stay away. Get off it, stop looking at it, stop playing with it, because you're gonna do more harm than good after you've got it to that first stage. Once it's set, depending on the day and the weather, that could be an hour, it could be 10 minutes, uh, and it could be four or five hours. Today, heck, it's snowing right now, so we're probably looking at about three hours before we're gonna get back here, and, uh, and the chemicals will have started reacting, but you'll still be able to play with the surface, and you'll see that's how we can get a real nice, watertight, uh, durable surface on top. Oh, I did fail to mention earlier, uh, because I want the new concrete to bond to the old concrete as best as possible, I put a little bit of uh, improvement, uh, bonding improvement agent on that base layer before we added this up. That's where we get to now. We're going to trowel this thing off, and uh, pretty soon we're going to be peeling a form and seeing what we got. So obviously I'm showing you how we're doing this chimney cap, but there's so many variations on the one you're working on. Uh, this one here, we use two by sixes on the side. You don't always have to do that. Often I use two by fours, but in order to get over those nice humps with the deep uh, uh, concrete, I switch it up to two by six. Sometimes I'll do a longer shelf at the bottom before I come up. Uh, visually, it felt like if I did that on the dimensions of this fireplace, it would kind of look like a sombrero hat, and I wanted to avoid that as much as I could. But I still want to have enough overhang to be uh, efficiently getting the water to drip free. I'd never do less than three inches and I usually wouldn't go more than five either. It just starts looking dopey and you have a potential for uh, a, a breaking point or a weak point where it's out there. Uh, just so you know this guy here took seven bags of concrete uh, of 80 pound quickcrete to pour it. Depending on your unit this thing's roughly four foot by three and a half foot uh, and obviously the thickness varies depending on the lumps that are below it. And if a lot of times, if you had to rebuild, which usually you do, have to rebuild your, your uh, top course of stone, leave that thing concaved in a bit, and then allow that concrete, the cap concrete, to fill that back concave and out over, and that just gives it a lot more strength. The cap is really essential. Uh, a lot of masons, especially years ago, I think they got straight up exhausted by the time they got to the very top of the chimney and they took whatever mortar was left in their bucket and they smeared it out and they called it a cap. Uh, not only does it keep the water away, but it also creates the heavy thing that holds the whole thing together. People think about mortar like it's a glue, right? That it's sticking all the stones together. Well, friction is as big a part of it as anything. And having something that weighs 500 pounds on top of your whole chimney actually helps to bind the whole thing together. Uh, just a couple things you want to keep in mind uh, when you are capping your chimney. So it's about three hours later. Some of those chemicals, the, the Portland chemicals, have started to bind uh, and it started to seize up a little bit. It's still a little bit early. It's best to have something else to do. Don't sit here and babysit it too much but just come on and check on it every once in a while. Some days this will be quick, some days it won't. Uh, but you also want to think in a hot day, the worst thing that you can do is let it cure too quickly. Like if the sun was beating down on this thing right now, as soon as the water has left the concrete, the curing process has ceased and it won't go any further. Really about 80% of the strength of that concrete is in the first three days. You want to keep it kind of wet. Sometimes this summer I'll have a little squirt spray bottle or have water in one of those garden sprayers and I'll keep a light mist on it and then throw like a damp blanket over top of the whole thing to keep it kind of a wet, moist, shady situation to get an optimal cure. You want this thing to be strong. 
The other thing, as tempting as it might be tomorrow to rip this form off and see the beautiful uh, cap you've made, way better to wait three days. That's when you're going to have your optimal 80% strength because uh, the last thing you want to do is be going too early while the concrete's still green and be popping a little corner off and then all of a sudden you have a crack in the unit that just didn't need to be there. So a little bit of patience there uh, and some troweling time. I, I, I know it looks weird I'm using this little tiny trowel to trowel this off but I have found these little uh, brick trowels I call them or, or pointing trowels can make an incredible surface uh, because you can apply enough pressure on there to really uh, push that cream up to the surface and, uh, and smooth it off. So we're gonna trowel this thing off, then we're gonna leave it to heck be, and then check on it in three days.